from a very early age, the age of about two, we used to go and stay for two weeks every year on a, a lovely farm down North Devon. And that sort of pattern repeated every year through to my teens. And that definitely sowed the seeds for me of farming. I just found it an utterly sort of enchanting, magical place. And the smells and sounds are really etched into my memory. I'm David Wilson, farm manager at Fur Farm. It's a, a relatively new position for me. I've only been really involved with the farm for a couple of years. We're in the High Cotswolds, so we're about a mile west of Stow in the Wold. And we've got a sort of contrasting geology, if you like, from good sort of bony, typical Cotswold brash on the top down to some quite rich, heavier land down in the valley bottoms. Nice dung. Hello girls, hello. So these are the red pole dairy cattle that we've got. It's an embryonic herd, so we're hoping to build numbers to probably around 50. By that I mean it's uh, uh, the beginnings, the nucleus of a dairy herd. The aim is to have a, an ultra low input um, dairy herd, so not feeding any grain, just uh, pasture and uh, hay and silage during the winter and to be selling the milk retail. So we're selling the milk through a vending machine and hopefully making some cheese as well. The goals of the, the farm really are to be able to produce good quality healthy food and really promote a, a very sort of healthy diverse wildlife population and I think the two are compatible and what I would say is I think they have to be compatible. You can't have one without the other. We are a regenerative farming system because we, we farm organically and organic farming has to be regenerative. The, the whole description of regenerative farming does have quite a broad spectrum, but essentially it's about a journey I think we all have to take. We're probably at the slightly more extreme end in that you know, we're, not, we're farming to organic standards, we're not using any agrochemicals. And we have a mixed farming system using uh, rotation, so we're you know, building soil fertility with sort of deep rooting herbal lays containing a lot of clover, a lot of legumes, so you're fixing atmospheric nitrogen, building that fertility that then enables you to grow two or three cereals um, after having those lays in for three or three, four, five or more years. The, the cereals that we grow on the farm are mainly um, heritage varieties, so, and by heritage I mean these are crops that are over 100 years old in some cases, they're very diverse mixtures of these old grains put together by a friend called John Letts, who is a, an expert in this field. But essentially, we're preserving those genetics, which is really key to our survival. I mean, really important part of sustainability is genetic conservation. So not losing those genetics. We've lost something like 90% of our food genetics in 100 years, which is pretty terrifying. So we're keeping them going, but they also supply sort of subtly different characteristics to the food that we eat. Because we've, you know, used so-called improved varieties the whole time, which is ultimately about lifting yield, we lose some of the subtle characteristics which are probably, uh, and in some cases proven to be, key to, to good human health. So we, we grow these varieties loosely called land race mixtures, so genetically very diverse, um, and they will go for uh, human consumption, so for bread making um, and uh, you know, whatever else you use the flour for and, and also for distillation. Uh, we also grow malting barley, um, so that obviously goes for, for, for beer and similar products. The aims of the farm really are to produce healthy food uh, from a healthy environment. So you know, the idea is really to work with, with nature, with the natural world, to be able to produce our food and have this sort of really healthy, thriving, buzzing um, wildlife running um, alongside or within. So a mixed, mixed herbal lay is a, a diverse mixture of plant species. So you've got grasses, um, which is what you'd expect in a grazing mix, but you've also got a number of other plants, um, all of which have very different rooting systems. Some go very, very deep, but essentially they are able to provide a much greater mixture of nutrients to the livestock that graze them. Uh, yeah, so this is a herbal lay which we graze um, our sheep on, and it's got a, a variety of interesting legumes and grasses in it. Some of the uh, legumes are um, 
natural wormers, so they have anthelmintic properties, like the plantain here is a natural worm and it helps suppress the worm burden in uh, lambs, which is very helpful. We've got three breeds of sheep. We've got the clean, which is a, 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 a very fit for purpose uh, meat producing lamb from Wales. I've got Hebridean, which is a small black, fast jumping sheep from the Hebrides, as you would expect originally. Fascinating in terms of meat quality and a lot of the, the differences that we, we really uh, think have potential. Um, and we, we're using um, uh, some Romney as well. But we're sort of, uh, I guess, less fixated on breed and a bit more fixated on, I guess, type of sheep in that we just want a sheep that will lamb outside uh, and try and produce two lambs entirely off forage. So th those are our sort of um, ambitions. So we've got them in the pen at the moment because we, we wean the lambs about uh, a week or so ago and then what we do every year about this time is we go through all the sheep and we condition score them. Um, condition scoring is probably the most important thing we do all year actually uh, and we've sorted them into fat group, a medium group and a thin group and then we allocate them to certain parts of the farm with different types of grass so the thin ones obviously go onto the best pasture and we try and get as much condition on them as possible basically so that we can get them all the use in an even, even uh, condition uh, when we put the rams in. Now it's interesting to note that historically um, wool brought a huge amount of wealth to the Cotswolds. I mean you look at a lot of the, the big churches around here, you know, that money came from wool and you have this sort of slight ironic situation today where wool is almost worthless uh, and uh, yet yeah, it is you know, a fantastically sustainable fibre. I mean, what could be more sustainable than growing this fibre every year on the back of a sheep? Um, and yet, you know, you can, I can remember a few years ago, I had a total wool clip of, I don't know, 1,700 kilos or something. And um, I think, you know, we, we sold it for about the price of a designer woolen garment, you know, the, the, and that really needs addressing. You know, sustainable fibre is really an important part of our future, again, be it from an animal or from a plant. The pigs that we keep, the Saddleback, an old English breed, a Wessex Saddleback, they, um, they, have a, uh, they carry quite a lot of fat, but it's a very good quality fat. It's a very pure white fat. Uh, we're experimenting with a, a, a sort of a lower input type of diet where we're actually grazing and uh, during the summertime on clover lays and these mixed herbal lays, we move them quite quickly uh, and they graze an awful lot of greenery. Um, and we supplement that with, with rolled grain and some whey and that sort of thing. But we're getting some very interesting results in terms of the meat quality, uh, including really nice marbling within the, the, the eye of lean. Um, and we're supplying a charcuterie maker who's very excited about that. Um, we like charcuterie in the sense that it's got a long shelf life, gives us sort of uh, uh, better opportunities to sell it ourselves. Um, here we are with a group of eight saddleback sows. We've got about um, roughly 80 piglets here. Uh, sort of trying to run a pretty extensive system. Block grazing them, uh, moving them once a week um, onto one new strip. And then every three days they'll get a, 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 new, a new section of clover. So here we are, we've got um, a whey oat mix that we, um, bit of, and a bit of milk from the, the farm from the dairy. Um, and a local cheese producer next to the farm um, gives us the, the excess whey. Currently this is the, the ration they're on, um, along with obviously a bit of fibre from the clover. Um, and we'll look forward um, sort of to maybe producing something with a bit more protein in it, potentially like a barley pea mix. But here we're, we're firing down once a year. Um, outside the, the ball goes in for a block of, of about two months, so we try and keep our firing pretty tight, um, all firing down together uh, as one big group. Obviously, if we see an issue with a particular sow um, or piglets, we'll pull them out and put them um, separately. You know, a typical system, you might be looking at, uh, well, two, three firings a year, high intensity. We're going for um, as low input as we can, with, um, you know, trying to get them trained behind a st one strand of electric fence. Uh, move them, you'll see the bale trailers in the background, does need a bit of a modification, but um, it's, it's work in progress. Uh, it can be moved with a, with a pickup to try and 
reduce compaction on the on the soil and the ground. Um, and fundamentally, what we're trying to do is, you know, add add the pigs to the system to improve soil health, organic matter, and um, and build build that in. So here you can see we've got some dung. Um, as we break it open, you can see the amount of fiber fiber through it. You've got the clover stem. You've got some seeds. And I guess this is all pretty representative of their diet, what they're eating. It's not full of, full of grain. Um, you can smell it and it's not a potent sort of like toxic smell, which I mean, whoever's part of a intensive system, you've, we all know what sort of that, that smells like. Um, so yeah, I think that's it's a good representative of what's going back in the ground, what they're eating, and hopefully a happy pig that tastes, tastes good. There's a couple of people taking it for charcuterie um, going forward, we're looking to process it in-house a bit more and um, through the mobile vending unit that I think you guys might have a look at at some point. Um, we will, will that will be an outlet. Um, and then, and yeah, look to sort of add value to it and, and take the product, which we're pretty excited about um, going forward, yeah. Well, this is uh, a new venture for us. It's a milk vending machine. The idea is that we're able to sell our own milk that's produced a few hundred yards away through this vending machine um, at a sort of retail price. It's to supply the local area, and it's, it, it, it's a sort of project that could be replicated by other farmers in other areas. We, we do have uh, plans for other products as well as milk. I mean, the, the machine on the right here is, actually sells the milk. The machine on the left can sell a variety of products. It sells milk bottles at the moment, but we have plans to sell flour from the farm, um, eggs, uh, charcuterie. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty flexible in what, what it can sell. Uh, and we do see vending machines as a good way forward in terms of keeping the costs of the operation down, um, but retaining as much income as we can on the farm. I think that one of the good things about this sort of operation is it does give us an opportunity to engage more closely with the local community. Um, who are obviously our first port of call for sale, but it also means we can talk to them about what we're doing, it helps them understand what's going on here, and if you like, it helps them appreciate their farm. In terms of, of, of wildlife on the farm, we've got fantastic skylark population, which you could go to these fields up here anytime and hear them singing away winter or summer. The corn bunting, umpteen different types of bumblebee, which is really interesting, because we know there's, there are issues with the bee population really interesting little patches that we're still learning about and we've got you know we're monitoring birds each summer and we're also monitoring the insects so we're building quite a database to hopefully show that we're making the right steps. <laughs>